So how do you feel when we have a situation where, uh, back to the, the, the point that was driving it, where the employers feel that they are under hostage, and that the employers feel that they are under hostage as well? How do you, how do you get out of this situation of conflict? <laughs> <laughs> number one, number one, I think we have to listen to what their fears are. What, what do they uh, ex think is going to happen? What are the actual losses? It's pretty shocking for some people to have saved. That's right. And I feel especially sad for those people near retirement mm -hmm. or who have re just retired, who've worked a lifetime and now they've seen their whole base lowered or they had money saved in a bank and they're afraid to keep that yes. money in a bank. Okay. So we have to listen to their fears and the pain. And then the secret is to come back to what can we do here? How can we work together? Okay. How do we take a negative and turn it into something positive? There are opportunities out there. In organization, it means the immediate boss must be positive in a genuine way. I think it's easy to be negative yep. now. Yep. But in a genuine way to talk about the risk, talk about the negatives, but also give people a sense of security. When that sense of security in an individual because I think it's shaken sure. in the organizations. Yeah. But can you trust your boss? We know yeah. that the fundamental process of building engagement in an organization is your immediate boss, and then the boss, and then the boss, and then the team. So banks, organizations, they have to go back and rebuild the trust. Uh, Mr. Coriza, you have worked in almost 85 countries in North and South America, Europe, Middle East, and Asia. Um, when it comes to issues of um, being held hostage, do you feel that there's any peculiarities or differences, say, between Asia and uh, and then in Europe? Be because in an Asian environment, where you have this reference for authority, more reference for your for the government, more reference for your bosses, the tendency not to speak up. You know, um, you how do you do you see that differences? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Culture culture is always a part of leadership. Culture is always a part of how conflicts are dealt with. Um, as you know, in the West, it's very much in your face. Sure. It's you know, no, not really showing respect right, yeah. uh, often. Speaking up. And, yeah. and uh, well, speaking up in a destructive way. Yeah. Now, in Malaysia in particular, I think you do have this uh, diverse cultural background. Yeah. So this, this is a real, real positive. Yeah. Because you look at some other parts of Asia, they don't have such cultural diversity. And so the bonding, the social bonding is so strong here. It's wonderful. But you mentioned it, the, yeah. the over adaptation to authority yep. does put organizations at some risk because people are afraid to speak up. Yep. Now, what you bring to the table is this respect, saving face. Mm -hmm. this, this is wonderful. However, if you're on a high-performing team and there is a conflict, there's a difference, and that stays under the table, yep. you can imagine it like a fish. Mm -hmm. It'll start smelling. Okay. <laughs> so what good leaders have to do is bring this fish on the table, and during this flopping around, going through the bloody mess of cleaning it, that's part of it sure. for what? The great benefit at the end of the day, the fish dinner. Sure. So what, what Malaysians have to learn and Asians have to learn mm -hmm. is how to be maybe more direct in a quicker way within their own cultural identity. I think this is the mistake sure. in over adapting to Western standards of leadership. Yeah. And I think what's happening as so much is moving to the East is that models of leadership for sure. Asia, models of leadership within countries are what's emerging. And those, those aspects are common around the world in the relationship, the ability to assert, and the ability to listen to people to inspire them towards a common goal. And I think you have an advantage here in Malaysia. We're talking about leadership. Um, is there sort of a different aspect or style of leadership in good times and bad times? You know that uh, we have a US presidential election going on now. Um, while the, while the, um, the public and the uh, the, the, the people talk about changes, they want something that's fresh, something that's new, uh, while those in the establishment talk about um, you need a serious leader in serious time, you know, you need an experienced leader. Um, but is there any such a thing as a, a sort of a, a, a set of leadership for good times and different leadership for bad times? Is there any difference? Yeah, I think there are different aspects to a leadership that's needed based on, on, on times, generations. Yeah. What we need now in in the states and in the world is more bridge building. We need more building of relationships. Your prime minister, who often speaks at the World Economic Forum, has been one to talk about this building bridges. What we've had in the United States is not a build bridge building sure. dialogue phenomenon in leadership. It was more of a 
domineering, more of a coercive style. And we have to come back and look now at how do we rebuild the collaboration. And globalization has hit us all. Look at the virus that spread with the financial markets. It was not just isolated in America. It spread like a virus. We are all connected. Respectful. And we must realize this now. And leaders must listen. Mm -hmm. They must be willing to be courageous. I, I think sometimes it requires more courage, courage. It may very well be that the next president of the United States would have to stand up and say, I'm going to have to deliver a certain amount of pain, yeah. which may mean I will only have one term. Yeah. But for the sake of the country, I would be willing to do that. Yeah. Now, let's hope that we have the courageous leadership with the right vision to help re-inspire trust. And to a large extent, I think if you listen to people around the world, they've lost trust in the United States, and now they've lost trust in Wall Street and the capitalistic market. And there were dangers. I mean, it was driven by greed. I mean, let's, let's be honest. Failed okay. leadership. Uh, you know that voice, uh, that, um, if you look at this, the uh, cycle of uh, financial problems, this is not the first time. This is probably the worst. But you have the Great uh, Depression in the U.S., you know, and in '87 you have this financial um, problem in the world. Uh, this is probably the worst. Uh, the question here is that why is it that we have never learned from the lessons of the past? We can talk about reading about hostage at the table. We can talk about overcoming conflict. But it's been human nature that we do never learn from the past. Your response, please. I think the problem is that the leaders are not consistent. See, politics is very different than organizations. In organizations, you have a process of succession. You move from one leader to another. And it may be that political leadership is significantly different because of elections, that you can dramatically shift from one philosophy to another, one approach to another, so that they're more interested in the benefit of the party or specific lobbyists and interests uh, than they are the overall process. So in that sense, organizations are more likely to learn from past mistakes if they think about it. But if they're not open-minded, and this is, this is what we have to look for in leaders, are they open-minded? Have they learned from themselves? If we take a book called Good to Great by yeah. Jim Collins, who has looked at those companies who really, really have been great, and to qualify, those leaders, those leaders had special mindsets. They were open to learning their own failures, the organizational failures. We have too many people who play not to lose. Right. And as a result, they don't take the right risks and enough risks. It's dangerous to be a leader. It's dangerous to be a good yeah. leader. You could be killed. Particularly at this time. <laughs> Particularly <laughs> at this time. But we, but we, we need that. And uh, it's so sad that the signs were all over the place yes, for right. what was going to happen. We had rogue traders. They knew this was a ticking bomb. And to not regulate is absolutely, yes, it was, right. an, it was an insane decision. I guess uh, been uh, uh, de deregulating was much more popular decisions than greed. Yeah, yeah. It was it was greed to benefit yeah. who the few perhaps to to think of how yeah. they were going to handle this in short term, and then it sort of took on a life of yes. its own, yeah. and nobody could put I the genie that back the in the bottle. Setting up the financial firewalls was just not popular decisions at that point. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, one final question. Uh, I know I'm taking up too much of your time. Um, how would you apply some of these leadership issues? that you expound on political leadership? How would I... How would you apply some of these leadership issues you've been talking about, hostage on political leadership okay. in general? I think we have to come back and lo understand that political leaders uh, must connect to the benefit of people. They must listen more strongly to the people. Now, that means also collaborating and cooperating with other parties. When and, and it's a challenge when you've got leaders who demonize. I, I think the biggest problem in politics today, and we see it happening in the States now, and maybe a little bit even here in sure. Malaysia, is the demonization. You and I can have a difference, but right. we don't have to demonize. And the other part is to, for leaders to know when to say goodbye, when to let go. And we have too many leaders who simply will not let go. Right. Now. One of the great examples in America is George Washington, the father of our country, who after his term in office was try, tried to convince him to continue. He said, no, I did what I could do. I leave. I now say goodbye. 
we don't have enough courage to say, I have done what I can do, I leave. I leave. And to see that the goal of political leadership is to be a servant of the people, not to be over attached to your own power. And we need creativity. We need innovation. I think what's a failure in political leadership is that there's not enough looking at creativity and innovation. Organizations who are for profit right. or NGOs, they, they live or die by innovation. They live or die by creativity and execution of that. In organizations, we have so much, or in, in politics, we have so much bureaucracy. And I'm sorry to say, in Malaysia, That's this right. is well known. And, and right. I know your prime minister has right. yeah. made every effort to say we have to cut the bureaucracy to, to clean up the corruption. Right. And what we have to do is go back and understand what can we learn from organizations for profit, nonprofit, exactly. and bring it into politics. Like I said before, the biggest problem is we don't have a natural secession process where you move from one to the next with the flow. Very often these are abrupt changes where the differences, the conflicts explode. And in politics, I would say politicians are generally not good at dealing with conflict. Thank you so much for sharing your time. On that note, I've got to let you go. I won't okay. hold you hostage. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you Thank very you much. So much. It's been a pleasure. Yes, uh, that was uh, George uh, Carissa with his book and talking to us about the uh, importance of uh, performance leadership, uh, uh, conflict management, change management, uh, dialogue and negotiation, dealing with stress, and of course, uh, overcoming uh, conflict. And it's been wonderful having him here. Thank you very much for watching this program. Thank you.